But have you ever been around a fire in the house or outside the house and the fire is just about to go out? I know for me, there's times I would just fan the flames. Then you put a few logs on or coals, whatever, and it's away again. That's a good illustration for us tonight. You might be in the house tonight and say, you know what? I know I'm saved. I know I belong to the Lord. I know I love the Lord, but I'm just not where I used to be. The only thing he has to do tonight is blow on you. Literally fan the flames. And I'm telling you what, before you leave this building tonight, you could be on fire. So, tonight, the subject is, what is revival? There's a lot of talk about revival out there at the moment. Over, I don't know about you, but I'm hearing a lot talk about revival this last four or five weeks. How about you? Um, of course, as genuine believers, we're yearning, we're desperate to see a modern day revival. Um, I'm sure that I speak for all of us. Um, we're longing for God to outpour His Spirit on our nation once more. America needs God. America desperately needs God. But I can tell you, the church needs God. You know, sometimes I wonder, if God didn't show up on Sunday, say the Holy Spirit decides to stay outside, would we notice it? Would we feel a difference? Because I can tell you there's churches in America, a lot of churches, where the Holy Ghost on the outside waiting to get in. But yet they're going through all the motions. They're, 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 there's preaching. There's worship. There's whatever. It's all going on. But God's not in it. And God forbid that we would push the Holy Ghost outside of these four walls. Um, <clears throat> so, we could be forgiven... We're getting excited when we hear of a potential move of God somewhere in the United States. Okay? I don't know about you. If somebody talks about revival, I'm not like cynical. I'm like, I hope it's a revival. I hope it's a genuine move of God. And you, many of us have heard of Asbury, uh, the university, what's been happening there. And many of the testimonies that I've heard seem to be genuine. That's all I'm saying. They seem to be authentic, genuine. There seems to be testimonies of repentance coming forth. Um, testimonies of people praying through the night. Um, people experiencing healing, forgiveness. But I've just heard a lot of them share stories of repentance. They were, they were compromised. They were apathetic. They were indifferent. And God has suddenly made them alive. And I'm just saying that I'm not going to be one of the cynics here. I'm going to wait and see. But the only way that we can truly say it's revival is if what's happening has an impact on that university and it lasts. Would you agree? If it's a true move of God, it'll last. It'll not just go like a mushroom, just grow up and then disappear as quick as it comes. So I, I genuinely hope that we are hearing about and we're seeing the beginning of something big in our nation. But I want to read this passage as our opening passage tonight. Isaiah 41, 17 through 20. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness as a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Hey, let's pray tonight. Oh God, Lord, I feel like we're on holy ground tonight. Um, 
Lord, the subject before us is a big subject. This is a subject that is close to your heart. So, Lord, this should be a subject that is close to our heart. I pray that you would just open our eyes tonight, that we would see how revival looks like. Lord, refresh our minds and inspire us tonight. Stir us up, O oh God, and just give us the understanding we need tonight to, Lord, experience personal revival, collective revival, O oh God. Lord, just thank you for who you are. You're a God of revival. We thank that. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of many passages in the scriptures that actually are revival passages. And this is one of the passages that has actually come up in times of revival. This passage has come up in the midst of it. This has been quoted. And often revivalists will say that this describes what revival looks like, but in very figurative terms. Um but I want to just dig a little bit deeper and establish what revival actually is because um, I think it would be good moving forward. If you're taking notes, you might want to take notes here. Uh, but Ron, I would maybe appreciate your help here and just uh, having a look at what revival is. What is revival? Revival describes a spiritual reawakening from a state of spiritual slumber, apathy, indifference, and stagnation. For something to be revived, it must first have been alive. Does that make sense, by the way? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we think of revival, and we think of thousands of people coming in and getting saved. That's the fruit of revival. Okay? But revival starts with us. That is why it first and foremost relates to the church. Revival happens when God becomes the focus and results in man being restored to a right standing with God. Revival is about the presence of God manifesting or demonstrating in the midst of God's people. I've, I've listened quite a few. Um, in the, back in the day, Roland, remember, remember the tapes? You see, back in the old day, we didn't have DVDs. We had tapes. You stick a tape into a tape recorder. Who remembers tapes? Oh, okay. So it wasn't that long ago? <laughs> Do you remember tapes? You put a tape into a tape recorder? <laughs> Who doesn't remember tape recorders? Put your hand on. Has everybody seen a tape recorder? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um... But um, I, I used to listen to a lot of sermons, uh, tip recordings of some of the old revivalists, including W.P. Nicholson back to the 1920s. And um, a lot of the modern revivals that have happened that have really left a mark. And one of the big things that they will all say is this, that there was a notable, tangible sense of God everywhere they went. Not just when they met together in church, but they would go to the grocery store and they said God was in the grocery store. They said they would go down the road and they would meet somebody in the street and God was in the street with them. It was just that he was there. God decided to show up. Um, so please know, and I want to maybe go into it if I have time tonight, just highlight how revival is a sovereign move of God. It's not something that we whip up. It's something where God decides enough is enough. Um, God's not going to put up with any of the the junk, any more of the junk the wicked's doing, or any more of the sleepiness and the slumber within the church. And it's like it's time for me to move. It's time for me to come in and change things. So please know that that it's a it. This is where God decides to move, and. If we're smart, we can recognize God moving and then we respond to God. I want to quote Spurgeon here. Ron, would you quote Spurgeon here? C.H. Spurgeon tells us the word revive is from the Latin and may be interpreted to live again, to receive again a life which has almost expired, to rekindle into a flame the vital spark which was nearly extinguished. Okay, so tell me this. Has any of you ever 
It's been sitting around a fire. I know in the old days we used to have coal fires in Ireland. Every house had a coal fire. And um, there was no central heating. It was just the coal fire was it. It, it warmed the whole house. But have you ever been around a fire in the house or outside the house and the fire is just about to go out? And you know there's something there. There's something to work with. What did you do to get the fire going again, Nancy? Stir it up. And sometimes in the old days, what what did they do? Oh, yeah. er, d- go ahead, Randy. Poke it. Describe that. Well, kind of stirring it and uh, poking the, uh, the coals. Yes. Do, do any of us remember the old timers used to have one of those like big like like a court bellow. bellow? And what did the bellow do? What happens when you put air on a fire? Yeah, one of the things fire needs is oxygen. I'd, I should be asking Lance here. He's an expert on fires and how to put them out and whatever. But would you, Lance, wouldn't you agree that air is one of the number one things for a fire? Yep. Um, if there's no air there, the fire just kind of suffocates, doesn't it? It smokes and just goes out. Okay, so... I know for me, there's times I would just fan the flames and suddenly there's a, what seemed like it was, it was dying. Suddenly it starts to flame up again. Then you put a few logs on or coals, whatever, and it's away again. That's a good illustration for us tonight. You might be in the house tonight and say, you know what? I know I'm saved. I know I belong to the Lord. Um, I know I love the Lord, but I'm just not where I used to be. The only thing he has to do tonight is blow on you. Literally fan the flames. And I'm telling you what, before you leave this building tonight, you could be on fire. Would you agree? It doesn't take much. Okay, the illustrations we were talking about there, Nancy, it doesn't take much to get that fire going again. But I'm telling you, if you're the real McCoy, and this house is full of the real McCoy tonight, If you're struggling and you're thinking, oh, it's an A to Z for me to get back where I used to be, I'm here. If God intervenes tonight, you're good. Would you agree? I mean, if God sovereignly decides to fan the flames tonight, we're all good. But the thing is, if you're not saved, it wouldn't matter if he's fanned. You're just like coals in that fire that are black. There's just no fire there. But if you're a Christian tonight, there's something there for him to work with. So, do you understand revival is literally getting that fire going again? And who knows? Maybe tonight somebody's heart is going to be set aflame that wasn't on fire tonight. Yes, Mary. Thank you. You stated that, um, you know, Christian, you know, they can state that they were, you know, they're not on fire as they once were. Would that also describe someone who's backslidden? Because I've also, I've heard that. And so, yes. would that mean, you know, um, the church, you know, was once on fire for the Lord, then, you know, we're basically like in a backslidden, apathetic state. 100%. Actually, we all know backsliddenness is not a, just a term that we use. It's actually a biblical term. Um, the backslider, you see, that's why the backslider doesn't want to be around us. Why? Because when they hear the truth, when they see us functioning, they know what's happening is real. And maybe they're in their flesh, they're just feeding their dirty, vile, stinking flesh. And a lo- the main reason I stayed away from church, I, w- I couldn't sit under the word as a backslider. I just had to back off completely. Why? I would come, it wouldn't matter what the preacher preached on. He could be preaching on marriage, and I was a single man. Whatever the preacher was preaching on, it convicted me because I wasn't right with the Lord. So, the backslider, that's why bringing the backslider under the Word of God, it could be the moment where this here happens. And what's in there, just that flame starts to light again, and before you know it, they're back where they need to be. So really the preacher is literally 
fan in the flames with the word of God. Go ahead, Curtis. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, there, to me, there's a little bit of a difference between, like, let's take you as a, like, you were still in the world, you weren't in the church, but yet there can be people in the church still, and yet maybe maybe they're not, uh, you wouldn't say they're, like, living in sin or, uh, you know, out there just rejecting God, but uh, essentially there's something missing still, like they're, uh, you know, the hunger's not there anymore or... The desire, or they're distracted, or you know, so so I, I there is a little bit. I mean, we know that there's a little bit of a difference, right? So, um, would you would you say, yeah? How does that? Are there different stages of you know backsliddenness too? You know, maybe you're just kind of barely starting to slip a little bit, and you're not you're not far out totally backslidden, but you're you're slipping. You know. Okay, here's a. The, the only preacher I heard ever say this was Brother Clendenin. And <clears throat> this is what he said. Are you... <clears throat> he said, none of us are in the same place we were 12 months ago, okay? Would you all agree? Yeah, yeah. Nobody's in the exact place spiritually they were. That, 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 that's near impossible. It's a bit like like treading water in a river like for two days and believing that you're not going to move at all. You're just going to stay in the same place. It's impossible. What he said is, so we're not all in the same place as we were 12 months ago. He says, have you moved forward in the Lord or have you moved back? He said, if you've moved back, if you're not, if you haven't progressed in 12 months, you're backslidden. Backslidden means to go back. So to Curtis's question, there is degrees of backsliddenness. Okay. Would you all agree with that? I mean, not everybody when they go back, uh, go end up in the world, end up drunk, end up sleeping around. Would you agree? But would you agree that every human being has the potential to go to do a lot of dark things, even as a believer? Would you agree that we have the potential in our flesh to... Our flesh is no different from the flesh of the world. It stinks. So you and me can... we. It's not just a matter of hitting somebody on a heart. We could murder somebody. Run. Right. right there. Yeah. So, uh, Kyle. Um, I do think the Lord initiates um, revival. I don't know if the word revival, the actual word is in the Bible, but according to this passage, 17, um, I would say it depends upon a need, too. If don't matter if you're in this church, outside this church, if you're not hearing the message. I mean, it's better if you do. But you can sit here and not have a need for the Lord. You can sit in this church every Sunday and not have a need. Okay? And you can tell the Lord in not so many words, you can say, you go here, I don't need you. I mean, we don't say that. But we can get that way because, quite frankly, we have a lot of stuff in this world. I mean, we have... So many luxuries mm -hmm. that we just don't have a need for much. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what this says. It says, when the poor and needy seek water, okay, who's poor, who's needy? They're seeking water. Mm -hmm. And there is none. And their tongue faileth for thirst. Are you failing for thirst? I, the Lord, will hear them. Mm -hmm. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. So, mm -hmm. Some, sometimes the Lord will take a step back, okay, and say, okay, have it your way. Mm -hmm. Do it the, what, the way you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not, it doesn't mean that you're, you're not born again. I mean, it doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Ghost. It just mm -hmm. says, the Lord just says, okay, have your way. And then pretty soon, read Job. I mean, you, you can have a need pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So then you'll cry out for the Lord, and he'll hear you is what it says. Yeah. So... Even though he starts revival, sometimes he starts it by stepping back mm -hmm. and letting us have a need for him, you know? Yes. Yeah. Amen, Kyle. Um, I want to read a passage here. You might wonder, why are we quoting this tonight on the subject of rev revival? But you'll find out in a minute. Uh, uh, Kyle, could you help us? First Samuel 3, 2 through 3, 4. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, 
and his eyes began to wax dim, and he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered him, answered, Here am I. Okay, just to give you a little bit of context here, this was probably one of the darkest moments in Israel's history. Eli had been a priest um, in Israel, but he was a compromised priest. Some of you know the story. What was his sons at? Huh? They were dirtbags. Guys, this is Israel. They were, they weren't just compromised believers. They were unregenerates. But Eli knew all about it. What did he do about it? Nothing. And how do you think God looked on that, by the way? Do you think God was going to high five that and say, hey, that's cool. I understand. You're just a man and, you know, your sons are playing up and whatever. No, God wasn't happy with it. But I want you to see here that what happens when you, you compromise, something happens to your vision. What happened to his vision? I would suggest to you that everyone you know that is nowhere with the Lord tonight, believers, they've lost their vision. You look in Scripture, what happened to Samson when he compromised? He lost his vision. You look at um, the, the, the last thing that goes whenever a, a believer is going down a road of compromise is their vision. So, Whenever you're alive for God, you've got vision. I need to see my mom saved. I need to see my sister saved. I need to see uh, the boss saved. I need to see you have a vision. But as you start to backslide, you start to lose your vision, your passion, your desire for others, and you just become selfish. It's all about me. Not about them. When you're on fire for God, would you agree? It's about him and it's about others. Would you agree? When you are backslidden, when you are um, going from God, what happens? Would you agree? It becomes poor me. Okay. What happened with Eli? Eli's Eli's vision went. He started to lose it. And look at that verse, verse 3. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple, before the lamp went out, God had another plan. It wasn't his plan B. And I can tell you, And here's something very important tonight. God can do without you and me. You think that you're so important that God can't can't do anything without you? Then you're a fool. God could replace any of us tonight. And he could bring somebody in here who's a better pastor than me if I think that I can't be replaced. Would you agree? You think that's a big challenge for God? So I'm telling you, God replaced Eli. And God brought a young boy called Samuel. And do you remember the story where um, God spoke to Samuel? Any of you remember what happened? Huh? Yeah. He goes in and says, were you, were you talking? And no, I didn't open my mouth. And then the same thing happens again. Oh, but Eli wasn't stupid either. I believe Eli was a believer. But Eli was a compromised believer. He was backslidden. But he had enough light in him to know that God was speaking to the young man. You see, God will not leave himself without a testimony. He always has someone, and he used a young boy called Samuel because he was available. And I can tell you tonight, all as God is looking tonight, he's, he's not looking all our knowledge. He's not looking all the letters after our name. God's looking someone who's available, who's empty enough of themselves to be filled by him. The Lord will not fill you up if you're half full of the flesh and half full of the spirit. That's not the way it works. He's looking for an empty vessel that's completely emptied so that he can fill them with himself. And 
I can tell you when God fills you, um, he doesn't run out of his Holy Ghost, by the way. You've heard uh, Cindy say this a lot, that her cup is full and running over. Well, I can tell you when you're revived, you, you're not just full, you're not just full of the Spirit, but you're full and overflowing to the degree where everywhere you go, you're just pouring out Christ. Amen? You just can't keep your mouth shut. You can't, you can't, you can't settle because it's just, God's just flowing out of you. And some of us remember times when we were like that. Where we didn't care whether the boss liked it or disliked it, whether the headmaster or the school teacher liked it. They were going to hear it anyway. Because it's the truth. Right or wrong? There's times where we were so full of boldness, we would have went into a den of lions. And we would have just, if God told us to go in there, we would have went in there. That was enough. And what I'm trying to say is that what was going on here was actually the turning point. So it looked like everything was over. Anybody know what ha um, happened? Um... Was it Eli's daughter in law? Anybody know what happened to her at this at about this time? She was having she was having a baby. And what happened in that incident? Anybody know? Anybody know what the baby was called? Go ahead, Ron. Okay. But they had gone to war. They had taken the ark with them. They had lost the ark. His sons have been killed. Uh, Eli fell off the, his chair and died. And uh, that's when she had, I believe, a miscarriage or lost the baby. Yeah, and the baby ended up being called Echabod, which means what? The glory of the Lord hath departed. Now think about this. What, what did the Ark of the Covenant represent? presence of God. Can you see here, I know this, you might be, you think, oh, this is a weird passage to quote at the beginning of a subject on revival, but I'm telling you revival looks the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. And backsliddenness looks the same in the Old as the New. Go ahead, Curtis. Well, it's like, uh, God just <laughs> says, okay, if, uh, if no one's going to do it, I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Because, mm -hmm. you know, then they take the, the Ark of the Covenant and they said they, the Philistines placed it in the in their temple <laughs> and God started to knock down their godly statues or whatever and, you know, and then pretty much started to kill the Philistines to the point where they're like, get, <laughs> get, the, get this <laughs> out of here. God out here. Yeah, so huh? God God takes care of it too, you know, even in our, our failures when we as men fail to do as he wants us to. Uh, he has his own means of taking care of business. Amen. But can you see revival here? Revival was... So God wasn't there for that a witness. He had this little boy that probably people walked past in the temple, didn't even notice. And God says, I'm going to anoint this young man. And he's going to bring revival back to Israel. He's going to bring the nation back to God. And... I'm just telling you for us that are older, that if we don't take God serious, if we don't get on fire for God, he'll bypass us and it could be some of these younger ones around us that he uses and says, you don't really want to get real for me? I'm, I'm not done doing what I want to do. The vision hasn't ended. I'm just going to use someone else. So that's a challenge for us. So the question even at this early stage is, are we in revival? Are you in revival personally? Are we in revival as a church tonight? Do you think if we were in revival, our church would be the way it is? So, you know, I'm saying this not to condemn you, but I'm saying we collectively need to realize we're not where God wants us to be. Would you agree? Because how can we actually address this subject if we are under the delusion that we're doing good. See, here's what happens. And it happens individually, but it can happen collectively. You can think, well, I'm doing okay. 
how do people think they're doing okay? They normally look to the right and they see somebody who's, who's kind of way behind them. And they're like, well, at least I'm not like Jimmy. Huh? And they look to the left and then they get depressed and they don't want to look at Sarah here on the left because she's on fire for God. So it's just like, so we have like a religious spirit. We'll say, well, we're not like them. I think sometimes as a church, we look around us at other churches and say, well, I'm glad we're not like that church. But then if you compared us to the New Testament church, like, are we the way that they were? When you look at the New Testament church, like they started off with a handful of people. They won the world for Christ. I think it was, I think it was AD 52, where the book of Colossians was wrote. I think it was about then. 22 years after the cross, it said the whole world had heard the gospel. Started off with 12 disciples. There's more than 12 people here tonight. Then it went to 120. We've more than 120 people connected with our church. They won the world for Christ. Yet, how many people have we saw, saved in this last six months? Let's be honest. How many people have we seen saved? There's something wrong. There is something badly wrong in this house. One of the reasons I was glad to get away for a week, I've been examining my own heart. I've been, I want to make sure that there's nothing within my life that is hindering revival. I want to get closer to God. In fact, I'm desperate for it. I'm not content where I am. I don't know about you. I, I just know that there's something missing and the problem's not with God. Would you agree? And I think it is good to take time out and examine our hearts in the light of the word of God and say, are we more like Eli or are we more like Samuel? Um, here's another verse. Uh, Kyle, would you read this? Verse 19. For Samuel 3.19, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Okay. So, brother, sister, when you're on fire for God, your words don't hit the ground. Would you agree? They go where God has intended them to go. What happens is, our hearts get cold, okay? We start to get apathetic. We get tied up with the things of this world and whatever but we wonder, why is my words not having an impact anymore? Why is, whenever I do, I did that before and it had an impact, or I said that before it had an impact, a lot of times because we're not in the place. But Samuel was in the place, and how did it go when he was in the place? What was the fruit of it? Wouldn't it be lovely if our words didn't fall to the ground? And I'm telling you, this is what revival looks like. Um, so Samuel grew. And here's the big thing. Sometimes we can miss this. The Lord was with him. And if God be for you. Okay. So see if I'm reading this, I'm getting so much out of one line. Okay. So Samuel's growing in the Lord. Would you agree? The Lord's with him. And... None of his words is hitting the ground. Like when he come into a room, his words had impact. That's what we need. When the wicked come through th those doors, they should come under conviction. When we talk to them, instead of talking about a whole load of tomfoolery, we should be actually sharing in the spirit, in the presence of God, life to them that's going to impact them. If they're not in the right place, they should be in the right place. And I'm sharing this because as I'm reading all this today, I'm like, wow, there's so much just in this here alone, just what's here. There's there's warnings for us, but there's also lessons for us. And I don't think it was an A to Z with Samuel. I really don't. I think it was very simple. He was a young man. He hadn't been saved long enough to be full of religion. 
<coughs> Anybody, any thoughts before we go any further on this whole subject? Christine. If there's a revival, is there is there like a pattern that people are on fire and then we get dull and then revival means that you get on fire again? Is there like a pattern that happens? In, in in revival, revival or Christianity or, I mean, in, I mean, even in the history, is there is? I mean, I think there's. I mean, we had the Great Awakening one and two mm-hmm. and all these things because, like, after forty years, people start like being. Um, you do you obey God, things prosper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you get kind of sleepy and, and content and comfortable. I'm just wondering, is is there like literally a pattern? Because if you're saying revival, you're literally saying. I'm, I'm like, I'm lukewarm. You're like confessing that you're not on fire if you want revival. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, actually, we're, we're going to go there. Okay. So just bear with me because it, if I start answering that question now, then I'm going to undo where I'm going. Okay. So um, I want to quote John Piper here. And by the way, this whole thing is probably going to answer your question. Okay. So. Um, Ron, would you read this, uh, John Piper? Thank you. John Piper teaches the idea of revival originates in the reality that, on the one hand, God is the decisive giver of all spiritual life, and, on the other hand, humans, even those who are born again and part of God's covenant family, from time to time drift into a kind of lifelessness and lethargy and backsliding and indifference and weakness. And when you put those together, two together, God as the giver of life and man as the ever drifting towards lifelessness, what you get is the need for the hope of reviving, coming back to life, a fresh outpouring of God's life-giving spirit on his people. That is what revival is. Okay, so I need to emphasize this because a lot of Christians, they don't really, they seem to misunderstand revival. Many Christians think that revival starts when the church gets a vision for the lost. That's not true. Um, revival starts when the church gets a fresh vision of God and God's will. Okay? So do you understand? What we do is we put the cart before the horse. If you want to be revived, you need to get a fresh revelation of Him. I, I've heard preachers more or less said, you know, you've lost your heart for the lost, as if that's the, that's the terrible thing. The terrible thing is not that you've lost a burden for the lost. The terrible thing is that you've lost a heart toward him. Yep. Do you understand? We, there, there's an order to this thing. You get right with him and everything else will get right. Um, but the problem's not that you don't have a burden for the lost or it's been months since you asked anybody to go to evangelistic service. That's not the problem. That's only an evidence that there is a problem. But the problem is there's something wrong with you and him at the moment. That somewhere in there you've stepped back from him and therefore you find yourself in a religious rut. And a religious rut is really easy to get into. Just don't be diligent and intentional with your spiritual duties and it'll not be long before you end up in a rut. Um, I don't know, somebody has a definition of a rut. And it's something to do with, like, it's just like, anybody ever heard of it? Go ahead, Christine. I was just writing this down. Okay, so we got water. The water didn't go anywhere. It made a puddle. And I drive on the same, in my driveway, I drive in the same spot. And since the water didn't go anywhere and it made mud, Mm -hmm. I made a rut. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving in and out 
in the same spot and mm -hmm. you could just see it. It's just right there. And you're just doing the same thing mm -hmm. over and over again, but I could see the rut. <laughs> uh -huh. And it's like, you're going on the same path over and over. You don't have to think about it. There, it there's a groove in the ground. Um, they even say um, with the wagon trains, like mm -hmm. you can still see the ruts from the wagon, wagon trains from like 150 years ago. Uh -huh. um, like that, you're just on, on um, cruise control. Yeah. Go to Sherry. That's good. So we get stuck in that rut. Yes. And we can't get out. Mm -hmm. We've got to have the Lord get us out, right? Absolutely. Okay. Do you, do you, here's just a thought. There is a definition of a rut. You know, like a, it may be a funny definition, but it's a true definition. They say a rut is like three three feet higher than a grave. You know what, what is it? You know they talk about putting you six foot under? Well, it's like a rut isn't six foot under, it's three foot under. <laughs> Seriously, you, but some of the ruts at the moment, there's, there's ruts are like, it seems like it's like a foot and a half or two feet. It's just the ground's soft and it just keeps getting lower and lower. But that's what I think theologians will say. A rut is like um, three foot higher than a, a grave. So we're not, we're not entirely dead, okay? We still have a pulse. But we're we're kind of heading in that direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm putting this up for Curtis because I know he loves this site. Uh, Got questions, ministries. By the way, I've actually lately I've been looking at this site a lot more, and I wish they put who actually made these statements because it's actually a very good site. GotQuestions.com. Um. But I just, I went there today and I'm like, I wonder what they say revival is. So this is what they say. Um, Les, would you read this, bro? They say revival encompasses. Thank you. <laughs> encompasses. Oh my gosh, I can't say it. The resurfacing of love for God, an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for his word and his church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spiritual of humility, and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. Okay. Um, revival is a restoration of something that's been lost. Okay? So, it's not that you've lost your salvation. You've lost your joy. You've lost your passion. You've lost your peace. It's just, you know that you know, you know things aren't like they used to be. So revival is a restoration of all that there where it's like, wow, I never thought I would feel that again. It's like when the sun's just shining on you and you feel good, the sun, the son of God. So please remember, it's a restoration of things that have been lost through neglect, through the battle, through the lie of the devil. Would you agree that the devil can convince you that black is white, that north is south. Would you agree? It could be a lie from the devil. It could be something that happened to you which you haven't dealt with yet. So the devil could have hit you with something six months ago, and instead of dealing with it and overcoming it, that actually took away your joy. Or that stole your peace. And you're wondering, why is it when I go into the presence of God, I don't even, I don't even feel his presence or I don't, I don't have a passion for the, the work of God like I used to. Everything's a chore. It's like going, anybody ever been in, anybody ever walked through a bog or a marshy in, in rubber boots? Huh? What, what's it like in, you're like a, a sticky bog with rubber boots on? Huh? Steve, have you ever been through where it's trying to hold on to your boots? I walked through the tundra of them in uh, northern Canada and that's the way that is. It's really? Walking on a spongy, spongy mattress that wants to suck your boots off. Really? It's really hard to walk in. Well, what I'm saying is sometimes whenever you get backslidden, that's the way it feels. It feels like you're, you're, you're walking, you're moving forward, but every step's like, ugh, it's like, it's an effort. Everything's an effort. Um, well, that happens when you lose that, just that fire that you had. Somewhere there, the flame has just been taken down. And it's not that it's completely gone. It's just not what it used to be. 
And the good news is, you get under the word of God, there's hope. There's hope that that flame could be fanned tonight. Go ahead, Cameron. Um, I was reading. I was reading that last part there. There it said, "In a desire for repentance and growth and righteousness, mm -hmm. I have more than a desire for repentance. I have a lifestyle of repentance." And yes, I desire righteousness. That is my heart's desire. No matter how bad I get, no matter how low I get, I know that Jesus Christ is reaching his hand of righteousness down to me in that pit. And I've got to just grab a hold of that. So, living in repentance, be a man after God's own heart. One thing I want to, I want to piggyback on that because, okay, I want to just share for a moment just what God's been dealing with me for a year and a half. The way things were 10 years ago, 20 years ago are gone. Okay? I think we're in a different day than we've ever been before. Okay? We're at war. They're, they're... Huh? Exactly. You can fast, you can pray all you want, but between now and the Lord coming, it's going to be intense warfare. We can't say, oh Lord, why, why are you doing... Hello? I told you so. The, the closer it gets to his return, it's going to get... The devil is going to be given a season. Um, it's called Satan's little season. Um, he that restraineth is not going to restrain anymore. Okay? Society used to have a lot of restraints on it. I believe they're gone or going. Would you agree? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable out there. It's like God has said, okay, the devil is your last throw, but you're about to be destroyed. Um, so I, w I wanted to share this. Um, okay, I was going to piggyback on what Cameron said. Um, we can justify our sins, okay? Or bad habits or apathy. Would you all agree? We, we know the words. You know, I'm just busy at the moment. You know, um, I've got responsibilities. Huh? Or, uh, you know, I just can't overcome that. Or the Lord understands. You ever use that one? The Lord understands. Or the Lord knows my needs. Huh? Well, a lot of the time, and this is the problem, we're not getting a victory over our sin. We keep repeating the same thing over and over, and then we justify, well, that's just the way I am, or, you know... My dad was like that. My grandpa was like that. And I, I just, I struggle with that. And the Lord's going, no, that's wrong. Then we come into the presence of the Lord. And even though we have repented, we're just going through the motions because there, we hate our sin, but we're not turning from our sin. True repentance is a turning away from sin. I once was this, and now I'm this. Would you agree? We have redefined repentance as, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry for that. But Friday night, I'm going to be back at, at the same thing. That's not true repentance. We have convinced ourselves that that's repentance today. Repentance is a turning away from that dirty, vile sin. Brother, sister, we have redefined repentance to suit our carnal flesh. Are you with me to what I'm trying to say? That what we say is, okay, we do a sin, we feel bad for that sin, and we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Two days later, we do that sin, we're, we feel bad about that sin, amen? Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord's like, here we go again. Here he goes again. No victory, no testimony, no joy, no peace, nothing. It's just become a ritual. 
We make ourselves feel good because we've just so-called repented, but it's not repentance. Because you know what repentance is? Brother or sister, I'm telling you, God's been dealing with me with this. It doesn't matter whether it's small, medium, or large. God's saying, that's not repentance. Repentance is a turning away from. I used to do that evil thing. I no longer do that evil thing. Is that what we call repentance today? Is that the repentance we're talking about? Come here. I'm telling you, God's been dealing with me on this issue. That it used to be that believers were overcomers. Overcoming what? So I'm here to tell you that you feeling bad about your sin and praying a little prayer. Lord, I'm sorry about that. That's not true repentance. Because he knows two days later you're going to be back at the same thing. Oh Lord, I feel bad. I'm sorry. And all that is is just a religious sham. No victory. No power of the Holy Ghost. No righteous living. It's just... It's just... It's all a show. Listen, I'm telling you that's the church in America today. And I'm telling you that God has been dealing with me. Saying, you're a pastor. You're a Christian. You're a father. You're a husband. You you do that or you say that and you justify it. Well, the other person was out of order. And the Lord's, and? Two wrongs don't make a right. I'm telling you, do you see the days of making excuses for sin? They're over. You watch. I'm telling you, the season the church is going into, the Lord is wanting clean hands and a pure heart. Kyle. I'll give you a little analogy because this happened today. Okay? About a rut. Today, this happened. Uh, I wrote a note to some people. I says, you need to fix your rut. Because um, you could get stuck or I can, I'm going to get stuck, so you're not going to get your mail. I, in nice terms, I, yeah. I'm friendly with my customers. but <laughs> And so uh, she came in today and she goes, uh, Kyle... Uh, what should I do? And she told me her dad was in the hospital. And she goes, I, I need I need some advice. I says, well, you're asking me what to do? And I, I, says, I says, I'll tell you. She goes, I was going to get some rock. And I said, well, I says, you're gonna, probably going to get uh, a 1,000 pounds of rock or whatever for this 10-foot rut. I said, don't dump it all out. I says, fill it out, make a foundation, make a base. Mm-hmm. And I says, pile up the rest by the mailboxes and make a heap so it's always there and you can depend upon it. Mm-hmm. When it gets down a little bit, and pull it in, rake it in, and fill it in again. Mm. But I thought that analogy is that, you know, if we leave that rut, we're not going to get no mail. You know, the Lord doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, anoint disobedience. Correct. <laughs> you know, I mean, does he? I mean, he might for a little bit, he might have you he'd do a job or whatever, but uh, it, it, I'm just thinking of Samson or whatever, but but in the end of it, you know, it's not going to work out. So, mm. um but that was an interesting analogy today with somebody who had a rut. <laughs> and by the way, I think we are experts at justifying our sin. And I'm telling you, one of the lies we do say is, well, the Lord understands. No, the Lord understands we're a hypocrite. Or we are not truly dealing with that issue. It could be self-pity. It could be self-exaltation. It could be... You know, if the devil can't get you to lift yourself up as if you're you're this, he'll he'll put you in down in the gutter with condemnation and guilt and shame. Would you agree? If he can't puff you up with pride, he'll knock you down as worthless and useless and hopeless. But I'm here to tell you God will knows the exact se- right thing to tell you at the right time. But I do, over this past few years I've just heard so much justification for sin I'm like you know what we've all we've all got ourselves into a place that we need to get out of and that's where we call sin sin and say you know what God forgive me with your help I'm going to overcome this because guess what the Bible says he that overcometh we, we've we taken all this out with easy believism he that overcometh or he that endureth to the end shall be saved Okay? We we have today with easy believism 
oh, I made a decision so I can just live whatever way I want and God's cool with it. No, he's not. No, he's not. He expects holy living. And I'm telling you, read read the revivals that have happened in history. And the, what happens is they're all marked by a return to holiness. Not carnality. Um, listen, I've only got about a third of the way through my notes tonight, so this might be more than three weeks. But you know what? I don't mind. How about you? Do you want to dig deeper on the subject of revival? And by the way, um, Christine, we didn't get answering your question tonight, but I, I have a, some really, I feel, nuggets in regard to that question. So I, I'm, I'm anticipating we'll get to address it next week. And you know what? I'd rather go through this slowly and cover all the bases than just go too quickly. And then at the end of it, we're like, we kind of got an intellectual knowledge of, of revival. But in our hearts, we kind of, we're not getting it. There's something about this subject that I want to get deep in my heart. That I, I'm not just, I know what revival is. I am revival. You are revival. Steve. Sydney and I can also let people borrow the, the Ulster Revival, 1859. Yes. Um, that was an awesome, awesome DVD. Yeah, definitely. And, I need to. I used to have the 1904 Welsh Revival, and I've lost it. I, unless somebody else has it that I've lent it to. Do you? Um, if you do, I, I want to get a copy of it because um, that's very powerful. That was a revival that came through the young people, and it swept the whole nation. Ten percent of the population got saved in one year. 1904. Um, go ahead, Steve. 1903 or yes. something like here in the United States. We have that one. All. I have, I'm pretty sure we still have that one also. Amen. Well, let's pray tonight. And let's just, let's just before the, the Lord humble ourselves tonight. And if God wants to speak to us individually, let's leave, leave ourselves open to the Holy Spirit to put his finger on anything that's, that's not forsaken. Like if, if there's a sin in your life that just keeps happening, it's not forsaken. Would you agree? It's ongoing. A sin that's not forsaken is ongoing. It's not repented of. Um, I just want to encourage you tonight to let God put his finger on whatever it is. It could be a number of things. If, if you're like me going through a season where God's just exposing you to you, it's, it's not pretty. But I'm telling you, it is special. Because he loves you enough to actually put his finger on issues. Um, so I'm here to tell you it's not good enough to feel bad for your sin. There has to be a forsaken of sin. Father, tonight, we just humble ourselves in your presence on this holy, holy subject. Lord, I do believe that you want to bring revival to this church collectively. Lord, you want to bring revival to us individually. and. Lord, you want to bring revival to our community. You want to bring revival to the United States, oh God. And I pray that just something would happen as we look at this subject that would stir us up, that would prepare us. Lord, when you decide to move, you would find empty vessels in this house ready to be filled and to be used as instruments in your hand to accomplish your purposes. Lord, I pray that you'll bring more people here next Tuesday night. That, Lord, in our church there will just be a, a rising of the tide. Lord, a, a rising of interest. Lord, in your word. In revival. Lord, in just just stepping out of the, the apathetic. And Lord, the mundane. Lord, what we're doing at the moment is not working. Lord, I pray that you'll bring sinners and backsliders in on Sunday night. Give us favor as we start to invite people to come. I pray from... Lord, from tonight forward, Lord, that there will be favor, just like none of Samuel's words hit the ground. I pray that none of our words would hit the ground. As we ask people to come, that, Lord, you would give us favor with them. Lord, just give us a burden for the lost. But, Lord, we know that it starts with getting close to you. As we get close to you, we'll feel your heart for other people. So, Lord, we commit our, our service to you. Thank you for everyone who's come tonight. I pray that you'll give us travel and mercies as we travel home. And Lord, just bring us back, Lord, whether it's tomorrow night for the youth and children or whether it's um, 
Sunday, bring us back, expecting you to move. And Lord, just bring revival to this church. Lord, it could be Sunday. Lord, will you just decide to move? And Lord, that we just move as you move. Lord, would you do a quick work in each of our hearts? In Jesus' precious name, amen.